Welcome and welcome back. Um, we're uh, here to uh, introduce you to the sky, the stars, the planets, much as if we were sitting around a campfire looking up, or as originally planned uh, to be in a small group at the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, do a little bit of talking, explaining about what's uh, happening in the sky, things to look at, and then we'd actually step outside and point up at the real sky to do something practical. Until then, we're zooming around a bit. So first and foremost, uh, these sessions, uh, it's all about uh, looking, what you can see with your eyes. No telescope is required. Binoculars are great if you have them, and actually today we'll be talking a little bit about binoculars. Um, we don't um, cover black holes, dark matter, dark energy, um, or how planets are made and evolved, because uh, we get a lot of really neat uh, speakers that are monthly RASC meetings uh, who do talk about those kind of things. Um, so one of the things I will, will repeat and keep repeating is it's really crucial for you to make a point to step outside every clear evening you have, even if for five minutes, uh, just to reinforce the names of uh, the stars and the constellations that identify the major planets. And it just to get you into that, um, remembering where things uh, are in the sky. Um, we've tried to design these sessions so you can enter the loop at any time without being overwhelmed or having to catch up from uh, previous ones you might not have attended. Uh, concepts will generally repeat on an annual cycle and uh, the goal is to help you earn the certificate and pin for Explore the Universe, a free welcome program from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So please download and print out the PDF for it. It's The link is in the uh, meeting uh, website uh, that uh, you've uh, clicked on to get here. And um, so, yeah, uh, print it out and uh, uh, follow along and uh, we'll uh, get you uh, your certificate and pin if you get out there and identify things. Um, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is our parent organization, a nonprofit group of 5,000 plus amateur astronomers and a handful of professionals dedicated to the advancement of astronomy and allied sciences. The Edmonton Centre has 300 plus members and, as you likely know, holds monthly Zoom meetings. Uh, we have a very active observing and astro imaging group who post to our Facebook page and our email chat list. So by all means, uh, these are open to the public, even if you're not a member. So uh, do uh, join in and uh, you're, uh, you're going to learn something by uh, sitting in and always uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, don't feel at all that, uh, oh, this is a really dumb question. It's We all start from ground zero with uh, no knowledge of the sky just about. So uh, um, any question is uh, is is normal. A uh, uh, big thank you to uh, Berta, who helps me out here every uh, month. Uh, Berta's visual observing skills are really ramping up. She's currently working on her introduction to deep sky observing and lunar certificates as well. And uh, we've, uh, uh, through her inspiration, we're, we're, uh, we're going to shift things around and focus uh, quite a bit more on the Explore the Universe certificate. Um, so if you can't get enough of this fast enough, please ch check out the links to more introductory uh, sessions uh, created and recorded by our national office. So uh, with that, I will share screen and we will I can find share present here we go I think loading tick 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 Yeah, my uh, other laptop um, decided to uh, uh, twice in two days uh, do the uh, update for Windows 10. So uh, it was very annoying. Okay, so this uh, session we're going to um, cover the following topics. Uh, with, uh, some 
satellites, what's up in the April sky a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about binoculars, the seas of the moon, and the beehive star cluster. And then we'll finish with any questions uh, you might uh, have. But uh, feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, ask a question um, if you need. So uh, satellites, um, these are man-made objects that uh, orbit uh, the Earth, and the most prominent one is the International Space Station. Uh, shorthand, uh, everybody calls it the ISS, International Space Station. Uh, it's one of uh, the brightest objects in the sky. Uh, it moves with about the speed of a high-flying plane, apparent speed. In reality, it's uh, going much faster than that. But if you were just to look up in the sky and you see a bright dot that's moving with about the same speed as a high-flying jet plane, uh, then uh, that is very likely the International Space Station. Um, it's actually, um, it has um, uh, sessions where it shows up in the evening, which is what we're getting now, and then at other times of the year as uh, our uh, the Earth's orbit carries it uh, around the sun, the angles change and it shows up in the morning sky. But uh, right now we're getting some wonderful evening passes and uh, tomorrow night uh, we've got one uh, at, um, it says here, uh, 1042. And uh, that'll uh, be uh, relatively low. The one on the 26th, a little e earlier in the evening, uh, just before 10 p.m., and it'll come up really high. So this is, um, there's a link to this website on uh, the webpage for this session, and um, it's called heavensabove.com. Uh, you, you don't have to uh, create an account, but uh, when you do, it then remembers that um, you uh, um, are, uh, say, in Edmonton. So that because um, getting these times for uh, someplace on the equator is not helpful. So uh, when you click on one of those, I should just sort of go back up here. When you click on one of these blue links here, it will then take you to a uh, sky chart and will show you the path that the satellite, in this case, the International Space Station, will take on the sky and it'll actually show you the times of uh, uh, the, the evening. And it, it takes a, a good five minutes to uh, cross the sky. Um, it appears to move very slowly when you first see it and then, then it seems to um, speed up a little bit as it crosses. It is going at a constant speed, it's just the perspective. So um, with, uh, with the International Space Station uh, introduced and moving along, um, we are looking at the um, evening sky here just around 9 p.m. or so. And it is uh, one of the most marvelous times of the year to be out in the evening. Uh, the uh, winter sky is full of very bright uh, stars. Um, the Milky Way actually crosses through here. You just can't see it from the city. And uh, the uh, most prominent things to see, uh, oh, I should uh, just stop for a second. The middle of the chart is overhead. So when you do print it out, um, remember that essentially um, crane your neck back and look up into the chart to see what's overhead. Uh, the S is if you look south, put the south part of the chart at the bottom. And uh, just to the right or west of south is the wonderful constellation Orion. It's a very prominent uh, shape, and it's three beautiful blue-white stars that point to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. So um, this is one of the, the easiest objects to start off uh, your Explore the Universe certificate is identifying Sirius. So it's like brightest uh, star in the sky. Um, and a beautiful blue-white twinkling uh, object. And the constellation is Canis Major. It's a bit trickier uh, to see, but in terms of a, a constellation to remember, Orion. And so that's already two objects on Explore the Universe. Um, okay, and so I think this is... Um, oh yeah, we're then going to... 
uh, switch, I've rotated the chart now to put east at the bottom. So if I'm looking east, I will see the bright star Regulus. And Berta will uh, be talking about that uh, very shortly in the constellation Leo the Lion. And if you rotate the chart all the way around so that north is at the bottom, then and you face north you have to remember to face the direction that's uh, at the bottom uh, we'll have uh, very high in the sky the big dipper upside down uh, the big dipper is also called ursa major and we've got the two pointer stars that point at polaris so uh, with that i'll switch over and let uh, berta carry on for a little bit Yes, um, so Alistair and I have decided that we want to play a little bit more emphasis on the objects that are in the Explore the Universe certificate. If you don't have it, you may want to print it because um, it's a beautiful kind of a scavenger hunt of the universe and it's divided into constellations, the moon study, solar system, uh, deep sky objects and uh, double and multiple stars. And so there are several objects that one is required um, to see. For example, for the constellations, they list 24 different constellations and, um, and stars, and you should at least see 12 of those to get the certificate among the other things in the program. So uh, starting with the spring constellations, uh, today we are gonna cover two of the, the spring constellations that are listed in the program. Um, the first one of those is the constellation Leo, the lion, okay? So like Alistair has mentioned, if you look in the southeast, so you look basically, or you can be facing south and but more towards the east, or you be in the east and then um, you will be looking a little bit higher. Um, you will see, uh, Alistair, can you please cover it with the, <laughs> with the mm -hmm. mouse? You will see this constellation, um, uh, which is, uh, it looks, you can, you can imagine that it can be a lion, right? So it will have a head, um, the body of the lion, um, and then the part. Uh, so it's kind of like a sitting lion in my head, although they normally they draw it as a standing lion. Um, and so Leo, according to, and so here in, in italics, I have put the description that is given in the Explore the Universe uh, certificate. So what is the descriptions that are given for every constellation? So for Leo, it's a large constellation that actually looks like its name and note, note the sickle asterism. So one of the, if you look at Leo, actually there is that, that part of the constellation that looks like a question mark or a sickle, like the one, the instrument that the death is normally portrayed with. Um, and so that, uh, those are the brightest stars in the, well, no, Okay, the nebula is very bright too, but because they're all of them, most, most of them are very bright. You can actually see that object very clearly from the city. And you can think of it as a question mark and that will be the, the head of the lion. Uh, and so this constellation is, as I say, now high up in the southeastern sky. And the sickle is very visible from the city. And can you please go to the next slide? And so I, here, I, I, it's just exactly the same region of the sky, but instead of just showing the, the stars themselves, I also added the, the mythical figures as they were drawn. So you can still see the sickle and the part, the, the, and then the back part of Leo. Um, but now you can see how the lion was so in there. And so the Explore the Universe in the certificate lists two stars that one should try to aim at seeing. All of these, all these things can be, uh, be done by eye. You don't need binoculars or anything. And so the first one is Regulus, um, which is at the very bottom of the sickle, or will be like the dot in the question mark. Um, and as I say that, uh, Regulus is 77 light years away from us. So that's actually relatively close. Um, and it's a blue white star. Um, and it has uh, two companions that can be easily seen with binoculars. So it actually, yeah. Uh, so if you look at it with binoculars, you see uh, kind of a, it splits into a double star. Um, and then the nebula, 
at the very back of the, of the lion. Uh, it's 36 light years away from us, so it's a little bit closer than uh, Regulus, and it's a white star. And just a fun fact about this star is that it has a, the, a disk of debris around it that can be seen by uh, studying the infrared emissions of, of this star. And so that means that uh, it could have planets around. It hasn't been seen yet, but it's one of these stars that because the way we understand planet formation, when there is such disk of debris around, um, then that means that planets uh, could be orbiting that kind of a star. Um, any question about Leo? Um, if not, we can move to the second constellation for April, uh, which is uh, Ursa Major, which um, Alistair has already located in the whole sky chart. Uh, I just, in this, in this um, figure that I've put, I think I had it at seven in the afternoon or at eight in the afternoon. So it's a little bit, um, Alistair was having it at nine and a half, so 9.30 or so. So uh, um, Ursa Major is what we call a circumpolar constellation. That means that this, this constellation is in the sky all year round. All the constellations, well, constellations that we see around Polaris, the Polaris in the, can you point to it, um, oh, Alistair? Sorry. <laughs> so Polaris is the North Star. And so we know that Polaris is always in the same place in the sky. It's always with, um, facing north. And the constellations around Polaris, they just along during a night will spin around Polaris uh, and complete a circle, which is actually not the constellations movie, but us. The, the, what we are seeing there is a rotation of the Earth because the axis of the Earth is pointing towards Polaris by chance. There is nothing magical about it. It just happens to be pointing in the direction of Polaris. And as the Earth rotates, we see those constellations rotating too. And so depending on what time of the night you are looking at the Big Dipper, you are gonna see it in a different orientation with respect to Polaris. Um, so I think I, point, uh, I plotted here around 7.30 or something like that in the afternoon, I think. Um, so uh, this constellation um, is actually for, for the, uh, it's, a, it's a bear. So if Alistair, do you, do you mind covering? Mm -hmm. So the head of the bear will be at the very front. The, nope, think, sorry. <laughs> yes, the, the head of the bear will be at the very front and then it has its paws. Um, but um, the part that is more clearly visible and everyone knows about is actually what we call an asterism, which is not a constellation itself, it's just a part of a constellation. The same way that the sickle was an asterism for Leo, because sickle is not the, the whole constellation, it's just a part that is more easily, easily can be recognized more easily. The Big Dipper is an asterism for um, Ursa Major, uh, because those stars are really bright and they can be seen very clearly in the sky. Although I think I have seen the whole thing from the city too, on a good clear night. Um, you can guess the whole bear, but the Big Dipper is much more, is easier to see. And so the, the, I, the Big Dipper is a constellation that pretty much everyone knows. You see it looking north. And the, one of the most important things of the Big Dipper is that we use it to, as a pointer to Polaris and later and a little bit farther in the sky to Arturux. So to point from the Big Dipper to Polaris, you have to take the two stars at the end of the bowl, um, uh, trace a line that goes around from then and move that line five times and then you will arrive to Polaris. Despite um, some people will say Polaris is not by any means the brightest star in the sky. Um, so it's actually people expect something really flashy when they are looking for the North Star, but it's not. It can be seen from the city, no problem, but it's not the brightest star. Um, and so from, um, and Polaris is part of the Ursa Minor constellation, the little bear that always accompanies the big bear, right? And at least to my eyes and other ones can correct me, 
but normally from the city, the only things that I can see from the little bear is Polaris and the two stars at the very end of the, deep, of the bowl. I normally don't see the stars in the middle from the city, at least myself. Um, mm. They are too faint to be seen. Um, and so... And, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll add something when you finish. No, I, I think I'm done for for uh, in this slide. So okay. please go ahead. Um, uh, I, over the last couple of years, I've been uh, helping people uh, get started, overcome their initial hurdles. And the ones who want to take images of the sky, they need to point their equipment at Polaris. And um, surprisingly, um, to those of us who have seen it thousands of times, just like, how can you miss it? It's, you know, you just follow the pointer. But um, this star down here is just about the same color and same brightness. And it's on the same side of the bowl. But as you notice, it's coming sort of through the middle of the bowl. But if you're not quite familiar with the sky, um, you might mistake uh, COCAB for Polaris. But what I always tell people is um, uh, if, you if you're if you not sure, look for the second star near uh, COCAP. And it's like, if Polaris has two stars, then you're not looking at Polaris, you're actually <laughs> looking at COCAP. So mm -hmm. it's uh, adjust. And it's um, what shouldn't be surprising is after about a year of uh, looking at Polaris, you're, you uh, tilt your head back a certain amount and you, ha you develop muscle memory and you just, after a little while, you just automatically look at the right place. Mm -hmm. And yes, another fun fact about Polaris is that the height of Polaris is over the horizon in degrees is equivalent to the latitude of wherever you are on Earth because as the axis of the Earth happens to be pointing to Polaris by chance, if you are in the North Pole, you will see it totally overhead. And if you are in the equator, you will see it pretty much, you won't see it because it will be in the horizon. So here in Edmonton, uh, Polaris is 55, 53 degrees above the horizon. So like Alistair says, it's always gonna be there, it doesn't move. So, so when you, you just develop that, you know exactly more or less where to find it. But it's not an, uh, you know, it's like Alistair says, it's a very easy start to confuse. Um, I, I sometimes, I mean, I, I really have to do the whole exercise of going from the Big Dipper to Polaris, at least myself. I'm not polar aligning my telescope all the time because I don't have, I am a visual astronomer, so I don't need to look at Polaris very often. Um, so when I want to look at it, I really have to do the exercise of following uh, the, the, the Big Dipper to it because it's not a, a bright star, it's just one among, among others. And so, yeah, at least to me, it's not something that jumps at me. Um, okay, can we go to the next slide, please? And so again, this is, uh, this is an image of how the big, uh, the big, the Ursa Major uh, is seen um, as a whole mythical figure. Uh, and it's another fun fact is that it actually has a tail, but bears don't have a tail. So different legends have different explanations why actually this bear happens to have a long tail. Uh, but it's still also curious that different cultures, cultures in, around the world have identified this constellation with a bear. Um, maybe it's just transfer of people traveling from one place to the other, or I don't know. Um, so, and the Explore the Universe certificate uh, has two stars uh, that ask, are asked for you to look at them um, um, to, to check off the, the Big Dipper. So the first one is Dabhe, I guess. I don't know how do you pronounce that, um, but that's the name of the star. Um, and Alistair is pointing at it right now. It's 123 light years away from us, give or take. Um, it's orange in color, as we can see here also in the, in the chart, it's a little bit orangey than the other stars. So maybe I should point out, and I don't know if Alistair or Jeff want to in, uh, add a little bit, uh, the stars do, do have colors. They can be white, they can be yellow, they can be blue, they can be red. Um, the color is related to the temperature on the surface of the star. Um, and so actually the hotter the star, the bluer it is. 
So stars that are yellowies and oranges, and they are a little bit older stars because they are almost done burning their fuel and they are lowering their temperature. And the brightest, star, the bluest stars are the ones that are young and hot. Um, so Dube is a little bit of an orange star. And by eye, you have to be really used to seeing the stars to actually distinguish their color. But if you look at them with binoculars, the colors start being apparent and with telescope, they become a little bit more clear. I will say, at least in my experience, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the more instruments you have, the more clear you see the color of a star. Um, and so what I have read about Dabe is that the rest of the stars in the Big Dipper are actually all part of a group and they kind of move together. But this one is not, it just happens to be there in our visual, um, but it's actually moving in a different direction so in the next tens of thousands of years, the Big Dipper is actually not gonna be a Big Dipper anymore. It will be just a completely different, a slightly different figure in the sky. Um, so we better enjoy it the, the way it is. Um, and then the second star is Merak um, that uh, Alistair is pointed out. So those are the two pointed stars that eventually will take us to Polaris. And Merak is 79 light years away from us. And it's a white star. And it's also one of these stars that uh, have a debris um, um, rings sp spinning around it, um, uh, like the one that we mentioned before. It was the nebula that was also having that kind of uh, debris ring. So there is also expected, it's supposed to have planets, but, um, but they haven't been seen yet. And maybe as a side note here, for those of you who are not familiar with the term exoplanets, um, you know, the same way that the, our sun has a lot of planets around. It's just, uh, we know that the stars that we see around have planets too. Uh, there has been already, so NASA had a satellite called Kepler that was launched, no test, well, I, no, Kepler was first and uh, already found like 2000 or something uh, exoplanets in stars nearby us. And now there is a second uh, satellite called TESS that is expanding our view of uh, and searching for most exoplan more exoplanets. So a lot of, of those planets have been detected um, um, around and have been seen. Not the planet, they, they, they measure, they see them by indirect measurements, but usually the planets are too far away to be seen. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a very beautiful, um, time for people who are studying exoplanets because it's uh, the number of exoplanets that ha are being detected are growing by the year a lot and uh, they are learning more and more and more about them and how they behave and by seeing so many different planets we can understand how planet formation and and other things um any question I think if not, the next slide is for is back to you, Alistair. Okay, thank you, Rita. Um, so this little segment is about binoculars, and uh, one of the things we encourage, uh, we being uh, amateur astronomers, encourage when uh, people ask us, "What's the best telescope should I get for my child, myself, uh, or my family?" Uh, we typically answer, um, do you have binoculars? Um, and maybe you should consider instead of a telescope uh, to uh, buy uh, binoculars first. And I'll get into a little bit uh, why. Um, uh, in doing a little bit of uh, research, uh, I was uh, delightfully surprised that um, one can get uh, very inexpensive binoculars. Uh, I thought, geez, is there an error in that price? Nope. $50 for a pair of binoculars. It's pretty reasonable technology for uh, that uh, little uh, price. Um, and um, the, uh, I will immediately tell you why uh, binoculars. Um, so, of course, they're good for daytime use, birding, wildlife watching. They're extremely portable. So if you're going camping and or backpacking uh, uh, in the mountains and weight is at a premium because you're carrying it, well, binoculars don't weigh as much as a bigger telescope. Uh, they're perfect for looking at the crescent moon, 
uh, stars in the twilight. Uh, they're a nice wide field. Uh, you can squeeze 14 full moons edge to edge in most standard seven times binoculars. Uh, so that it, it gives you um, a, a, a bigger picture uh, of uh, what you're looking at. Um, and just sitting back and looking at the Milky Way is one of the, the great joys of uh, being out at a dark site. You just lie back in the deck chair or on a sleeping bag or a blanket and just scan the Milky Way. Even if you don't know what you're looking at or what this is or what that is, it doesn't matter. It's just the um, the thousands upon thousands of stars. Uh, also, what's really good about binoculars is you're using both eyes. When you look through a telescope, you use one eye, and it's uh, really um, uh, it, it's hard for people starting out. Whoops, um, to um, uh, to use one eye and get used to sort of either closing or ignoring what's in the other eye. Uh, but two eyes uh, work really great. Um, and you can actually, especially from uh, uh, dark country skies, you can see hundreds and hundreds of star clusters, double stars, gas clouds, and even galaxies. So they're, they're just wonderful uh, instruments to start with. And um, uh, the uh, um, oh, I'll get to that um, uh, in a moment. Um, so what you'll see in binoculars, a lot of numbers, 7x50, 10x50, 8x42. Uh, I myself have uh, 7x50s. So the first number is the magnification, 7 times, 10 times, and so on. And, and it's how much those objects that you're looking at appear to be closer to you, or they look seven times bigger. Uh, the thing is, though, um, the more you magnify, the more you find yourself shaking. And this becomes increasingly difficult uh, the older you get. Uh, you're just not as steady as you were when you were 20 years old. Um, so 10 times binoculars are generally, I do not recommend them uh, as, a, as a starting um, in, instrument. The uh, second number is the how big the front opening is in millimeters. Um, and so that the bigger the number there, the uh, more light that comes in, and so the brighter the object is going to be. But the more glass you're carrying, the heavier it is, and the more quickly you tire, which means the more you shake. Um, there's a, wonderful resources on the internet to uh, show you um, uh, how uh, to get around some of these uh, sort of um, issues. So tip, lots of tips and tricks. Now, um, you just saw the that price. Uh, $50 uh, isn't much. The quality is going to be, well, you kind of get what you pay for. Um, but, you know, if you think about, say, bikes, I can go to Canadian Tire and buy a reasonable bike for $130. Or I can go to... Uh, one of the cycle stores and buy a $12,000 bike. And um, it really kind of opens the eyes, just like, whoa, 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 what? And the same thing happens with binoculars. Um, uh, I've looked through some very nice binoculars. Here's a pair of Nikons, $9,000 instead of 50. Um, but uh, I was able to look through uh, a pair of these, and yes, they are very, very nice. But of course, it's the only go there if you know what you want and um, it's uh, the right thing for you. Um, but um, uh, just because you get more expensive binoculars doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're uh, better. Uh, for example, um, uh, I myself uh, have um, astigmatism and I wear glasses to correct for that. And if I'm going to use binoculars, I need to keep my glasses on uh, because even though you've got these individual focusers, uh, or sometimes a central bar focusing. Um, th these do not correct for the uh, astigmatism in my eye. And so if I can't keep my glasses on, um, then the, the, a $10,000 view is awful. 
And so uh, this particular pair would actually be uh, not useless to me, but it would be a real shame um, because I would not be able to appreciate them. So my binoculars allow me to keep my glasses on. Um, and so I paid about $700 for them. But at that point, I knew what I was getting. Whoops. Um, so, um, so the $50 binoculars should be reasonable. Um, and uh, the, the point is you can always um, pay more expensive as you get more and more interested uh, into astronomy. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we suggest buying binoculars first, because um, especially the, the, the youth, sometimes you lose interest a little too quickly, um, but adults too. And um, if you're fundamentally not that um, enthused with astronomy, then a good telescope probably isn't going to help anyways. So, uh, but binoculars are always useful um, to, to look at birds and, and wildlife. So that's another reason we uh, recommend them. Uh, now, um, you know, what can you see with binoculars? The moon, star clusters, wide double stars. Um, now, what I want to do is uh, you know, stop sharing so you can, um, do I double click on, on my view? Or I guess, um, so here are my binoculars here. Uh, so the 50 millimeters is that size across the front. And uh, seven times, almost all binoculars. Can, uh, can you just see that there? There we go. That's the field of view. And, um, but um, the the uh, the biggest thing that you uh, should do if you can find binoculars uh, in your home, um, if they've been lying around, get them out. Um, is practice and if the moon is around that's great and it is in the evening hours all this week uh, but it's practice 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 because most people when we the first time they're out under a dark sky and we're trying to get them to look at something really awesome in binoculars typically is they point up but they they always point too low and almost always and we have to say, no, no, point higher, point higher, point higher. So it uh, takes a little bit of uh, muscle memory to um, to get used to where am I pointing in the sky? Like for me, I just, there's a star up there, boom. I know what angle I'm doing because I've, I've put in that muscle memory practice. And so uh, even during the day, uh, that's the thing you should do is go outside and go, okay, I'm going to aim at the top of that tree there and put your binoculars up and you'll find you'll almost guaranteed you'll be below the top of the tree and you'll have to get used to um, uh, edging up your binoculars. It's like, say, throwing a ball uh, um, uh, to, to a friend. The first times you do it, you probably throw too short and it'll just take, it takes a little bit of practice to get that muscle memory. Oh, if they're that far, I have to arc it up this high. And so same thing with binoculars. So find uh, building tops, anything that's not horizontal, but, um, and uh, like the, the top corners of uh, houses, uh, but especially tall buildings, tall trees, and just go uh, practice and go, okay, top of the tree and look up and eventually you'll get there. And so when you finally get out under a dark sky or um, even the city sky, oh, there's Sirius, that bright star, boom. And chances are, remember at the start, you're gonna be too low, so go up a little bit. We actually aim really well side to side. It's, it's the up and down that you have to uh, practice. Um, then a couple of other tips in using binoculars. Um, typically, you might find that you're shaking too much. So if you can, prop your elbows up on the roof of a car or, or on a picnic table, and that will uh, help a lot. Um, uh, I often um, lean on the side of a house and and actually put the side of the binoculars onto the side of the house and, and then that way that just steadies them and i can just tilt them a little bit uh, another thing to do and we'll see if i can get that is you actually grip one of the front of one of them let the binoculars rest on your wrist on the on the other and then you use your other hand just sort of as as a triangle and you drop your hands down onto your chest 
and essentially that become makes them really stable. So if you don't have um, anything to uh, rest on, uh, that's a great way of doing it. Um, and uh, so that's uh, a very quick intro to binoculars. Oh, focus, yes. Um, typically, binoculars will have a middle ring to focus, but they will also have at least one of the two eyepieces here. Will You'll be able to turn it, and that'll adjust the focus. So what you need to do um, essentially first, typically it's the right one that uh, has the adjustment. So you need to look with just your left eye. You focus that one first uh, with the middle knob, and then uh, you look with both eyes, and then you fo single focus your right eye until it matches. That takes a little bit of practice. So again, during the day, um, practice focusing on things that are close to you, then far away to actually get you to do that exercise of changing the focus. And, uh, and then when it comes time to looking at the moon um, or, or the stars, you'll be able to uh, focus fairly quickly. Um, and because it, it can be pretty tiring, you're trying to get, if you're new to this stuff, and by the end of it, it's, like, ugh, it's holding up a lot of weight. Um, so the, again, that's why big binoculars are not a good thing for um, starters, for people starting out. Um, go back to my screen here. Yeah. So um, get out there, practice aiming. And then I think, let's see. I think it's, is it just catching up? There we go. Um, oh, yes, yeah. sorry. Um, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to add to what Alistair had said that when I did the Explore the Universe uh, two or three years ago, I just used the, so Explore the Universe certificate uh, by the RASC is designed to be done with binoculars from the city by eye, it's, there are things that you won't be able to see. You're, you're going to need binoculars, nothing expensive or fancy. The ones that uh, Alistair has pointed will work. And it's also designed to be, to be able to done from the city. So there are a lot of things that you can, be, you can see with the binoculars. So when I did the Explore the Universe, I used my, I think I paid 60 euros in Europe for these binoculars that I bought to look at birds. And they work fantastically well. And they are also 10 by 42. Um, so 10 in magnification and 42 is the, the aperture like uh, Alistair has described Oops. and like um, and they have a ring for focusing and then as I progressed in my interest in astronomy I did end up uh, getting uh, uh, binoculars that, that are specifically for astronomy is Celestron Skymaster binoculars um, but they are heavier uh, than those ones. So normally I use them on a tripod. So I put them on a tripod and I look and I, I, I also like to sketch. So I like to, have, I like to have my hands free. These binoculars and even these ones gave me beautiful views of Neowise, the comet last year. I don't know if you all know about that. Anyway, and so these bigger ones are 9 to 69 in magnification and 63 in aperture nine times 63. So it's a little bit bigger compared to my other ones is the millimeters of the, the aperture ring. So you can see how they have a bigger aperture. That means that you can see a little bit farther into the sky, into the night sky. Um, but the, it comes with a, with a uh, cone that they are heavier and you, I normally need a tripod if I want to look for a long time with them. Uh, but anyway, I love them. So even experienced astronomers um, uh, Hobbit, astro Hobbit, experienced Hobbit astronomers have spent a lot of money on binoculars because they really are worthwhile. Even when you, when you have been observing for a lot of years and you have a huge telescope maybe at home, you still enjoy the view of the sky through binoculars. And there are certain things like today we are going to look at the Beehive Cluster that really binoculars bring the best of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I won't um, stay on this one uh, long at all. Uh, just if you do have binoculars, uh, I posted the chart at left uh, on to the uh, uh, as a image on the, on the web page that 
we have for this meeting. Uh, but there in the tail of Leo um, is the asteroid 4 Vesta. And the chart that's on there is reversed so that it's um, instead of printing black and using up all the ink, it'll be black stars on a white background. Uh, but um, the I've plotted just enough stars so that Vesta is actually brighter than these two stars here. And there's very few other stars in this area uh, that are um, as bright as Vesta itself. So um, it's uh, experienced people like me can literally wander outside and in three minutes, I can find Vesta in the hindquarters of Leo because it's that bright um, and that easy. It's not as bright as these brighter stars. It's, um, it'll be, as about as bright as uh, this one or, or that one there. Uh, but it's fairly easy, relatively speaking. So on to the moon and back to Berta. Yes, so uh, for the Explore the Universe certificate, after the constellations, the objects uh, that one should be looking at uh, is the, the moon. And so the first thing that you are asked to do is to actually observe the different phases of the moon. Um, and for that, you should go to Jeff, uh, what's up in the sky, that's when he gives you all the different uh, days of the month where you can see the full moon, the new moon, and all that stuff. But uh, here I'm gonna, there are, uh, for, for the moon, there are 12 uh, lunar basins in Maria, and you should at least see six of them to get the certificate. And then there are 12 impact craters, and you should observe at least six of them. Um, so today I'm going to focus on one mare and one um, uh, crater. So in the first slide here, we have mare chrism. So this can almost be seen by eye, even with my very bad eyes. I, I think, you know, when the moon is full, which this month happens to be on the 28th of March, uh, which is a Sunday, this coming Sunday, uh, the moon is full. And then you can see all the maria, in their Maria are these darker areas in the moon. And so the one that is more to the right or to the west, right, uh, <laughs> of the moon, the one that is kind of alone uh, there is Marechrism. Um, it, it is a large impact crater formed in the moon around 3.5, 3.9 billion years ago. Uh, that was a time when there's still big asteroids were roaming the solar system, big rocks were flying around and they were impacting in the moon and creating these big uh, basins. Um, and then eventually later in the stages of the life of the moon, there was a period where there was a lot of volcanic activity and this uh, basin got filled with lava. And that's why it's a little bit darker in color. So this is um, it's a large impact crater that eventually was filled with lava. Um, and so just a fun fact, uh, the Soviet Luna 24 probe, which was a non-manned uh, probe that was sent to the moon by the Soviets, landed in Mare Chrism in 1976 and uh, came back to Earth with some soil samples from this area of the moon. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, and then there is, unless there is any question. And then the other thing, uh, that I'm going to select for this month is the first crater that is um, listed in the, in the certificate, which is Petavius. Okay, and so this crater is easily seen when the moon is around three days old. And by that we mean it's three days past new moon. So when you have new moon, the day after that is the moon is one day old, the day after that is two days old, and so on and so forth. And so this month, as uh, in April, uh, I'm just oh, I'm sorry, the pages of my calendar. In April, the new moon is in April 12th. So around the 15, 14, 16 of April, 14, 15, 16 of April, around the day three, three days old moon, it's when this crater is gonna be easier to be seen. And for this, you will, unless you have very good eyes, I think you will need binoculars to be able to see that crater. So uh, if you have, uh, if Alistair, can you please point to, to it with the, you have Mare Chrism on the top, the one that we have just mentioned before. 
And then uh, below it, there are four big craters that are normally called the gang of four. And Petavius is the third of those starting from above. And it's, um, it's kind of the biggest and it also has um, big central um, mountain on it. Uh, so that is, um, uh, so yes. And this is a picture that Alistair took of Petavius. And uh, it has that uh, central, central mountain, this crater. And so with binoculars, you probably see kind of like a little darker spot at the center. Um, and so, yeah, that's the one that you are asked to see. And uh, so now at least you know how to look for Mare Chrysum and Petavius, uh, which is part of this gang of fort. So just mark these days in your calendar and um, three days or moon is up in the sky early in the evening. So you probably start seeing it maybe around five or six in the afternoon uh, during the day. And then when the sun is setting, it will be um, closer to the west, a little bit following the sun. Um, so you should be in the evening sky looking for the three days or moon. Any question? Okay. And um, the last object that I think we are going to talk today, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, from mm -hmm. the Explore the Universe is a deep sky object. It's in page seven of my copy. It's what we call the Beehive Cluster. It's part of what we call deep sky objects because deep sky objects covers a wide range of uh, different kind of objects, open clusters, galaxies, nebula, planetary nebula, really beautiful things to look in the sky. That's to me what makes astronomy fun. And um, N44 is the Beehive Star Cluster, which is in the constellation Cancer. Now, Cancer is a very faint constellation. And from the city, you pretty much don't see the stars at all by eye. You can see them with binoculars, uh, but you won't see them by eye. At least I don't see them. <laughs> I don't have very good eyes though. Um, but, um, uh, and Cancer is in between um, um, Gemini and Leo. So knowing where Leo is um, and knowing with the Gemini is, you can know that that area of the sky, which looks pretty empty by eye, is actually where the constellation Cancer is. Um, there are two stars that are, um, this is a picture from Alistair, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, from the cluster. Uh, so can you please circle around the cluster itself? Yeah. So that is the um, star cluster. It's, it's one of the closest, the nearest clusters, star clusters to us. So it's actually quite big in the sky. So it's actually one of these objects that are much more enjoyable to look at with binoculars because the telescope has a much smaller um, wide of, uh, field of view. So with a telescope, you can see basically one degree and this is a little bit bigger than one degree in the sky. So if you look at it with a telescope, you lose some of the stars. But if you look at it with binoculars, you see the whole cluster. And just a uh, side note, the first time that I saw, I saw this, um, it was a night with not the best scene. So the stars were tw twinkling a lot. And it was really beautiful because then it made perfect sense that it was called a beehive because you see this group of stars all twinkling and it feels like a lot of bees buzzing around to me. So I understood mm -hmm. then why it was called the beehive or at least that's how it looked to me. Um, so it was other times I've seen it with much more steady sky and then it doesn't twinkle that much. But when the sky is actually not so steady and there is a lot of twinkling in the stars, it's really pretty. Um, and then these two stars that are marked in the uh, Celus Borealis and a Celus Australis are part of the constellation Cancer. Um, and again, you won't see them by eye, at least I can't, but you can see no. them with binoculars. Um, so this beehive cluster has been known since classical times because in, if you are in a dark sky, you can actually see it by eye and it looks like a nebula in the sky. It's, it's hundred like years away and it's still one of the nearest open clusters to Earth. And uh, exoplanets, again, is one of my favorite things to, <laughs> to study. Um, exoplanets have been discovered in this cluster. So when you look at it, some of the stars in there 
are certainly known to have planets around. Um, so next, st next slide, please. Um, and to locate it, uh, try again, you have the constellation Gemini uh, in there with Castor and Pollux, which are the stars that you can, you can see from the city, no problem by eye. And then you have the constellation Leo with the sickle that we have just mentioned. And then even though there are a lot of stars in this chart, if you actually look at it from the city, it's kind of an empty area of a sky in between those two constellations. Uh, but if you go with your binoculars and basically start in Pollux and slowly follow the line all the way to Regulus, you will go across um, the Beehive Cluster and these two stars that we have mentioned, um, Astellus Australis and Astellus Borealis. And then the Beehive Cluster is in the middle. And once you're looking at it, you know that it is because it's so pretty. It's just a group of stars in there. Um, and um, it will be high in the sky due south and the constellation Cancer cannot be seen from the city. Um, and I think, unless there is any question, um, I don't know, I think we don't have much more slides left. I don't right? think so. Yeah, yep. no, that's, that's, yeah. I'll just move the slide back up to uh, the evening sky. Where we go? There we go. There's the evening sky. Yeah, so just a little bit um, bigger of uh, picture uh, when we it finally shows up there it is so um orion as the main guidepost and then castor and pollux and prosyon and then regulus off to the side and cancer's right here i i imagine an almost perfect equilateral triangle here and that's where the beehive is but i did I did well in geometry in school when I was <laughs> when I was young, so I I like triangles a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and that's right, Mars. I forgot to mention that. Um, uh, in the evening sky, you'll see three uh, orangey stars. One is Betelgeuse, the other is Aldebaran, and then Mars. Um, and uh, Mars will be just slowly drifting. Uh, night by night, we'll just be ticking over to the left. So uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing here and we'll go into uh, a panel. And uh, by all means, uh, if you have any questions, now's a good time. You can ask or you can write them in the chat. There is a chat. Um, so if, if you have questions, you can also add them to the chat. Oh, and um, yes, uh, just as a reminder before we leave, uh, this time next week, Jeff Robertson, who's one of our panelists uh, uh, here this evening, he does a monthly What's Up in the Sky this month. So uh, there, there's always a little bit of overlap, but uh, overlap doesn't hurt when you're uh, on the learning curve. And, and he'll be talking about things that are happening in the Edmonton sky uh, in April. And one of the key reasons is that uh, quite often with our spot being so far north uh, compared to Toronto or New York or Los Angeles is quite often they talk about things um, in the main press about uh, things that you can see very well from Los Angeles that you basically cannot see. <laughs> Uh, hardly at all from uh, our northern point. So uh, Jeff does a really nice um, talk about what what is visible from here, from out your out your door. Okay, Alistair, we have uh, we have three questions. Well, two questions. So the first one is: uh, Are the are more are the more expensive binos lighter in weight? I will say not specifically. For example, my my heavy ones, these ones, uh, are much more expensive than my lighter ones. Um, so sometimes when you get heavier, uh, more expensive binos, you get more aperture, 
sometimes you also the more expensive binos have much better lenses that have corrections so that they don't have aberrations, uh, which at night don't matter that much because it's more for color observing, like if you're looking at birds and things like that. Um, so they can, be, they can be lighter, certainly, but that doesn't mean that just because they are expensive, they are lighter. You should certainly check the weight um, of your teles. And as I say, I personally use these ones with tripod and, and that's fine too. There is nothing wrong with, uh, with using, unless you're looking at something really high, my tripod doesn't, you know, then you really have to crack your neck and then eventually it does hurt. Um, but uh, for looking at things in the view, like at the height of Orion, Orion or something like that, they, they just work fine with, with a tripod. Uh, but Again, like Alistair says, if you're going in camping and you don't have room for a telescope, at least always bring your binos. Um, and then you probably want a lighter yeah. one. I and don't know if... The, um, the, um, uh, one of the links on the, the webpage that we have for this uh, series of introduction to the stargazing, there's a link uh, for uh, recommended uh, astronomy binoculars. And there's also another link for a 90 minute um, introduction to binoculars from our uh, friends at the, the national uh, site of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. So um, you, you can, that's a, a good thing to uh, check in uh, with that uh, as well. And then the second question is, um, what is a good filter to use with a telescope to view the moon? So, um, so actually you, you might be in a better <laughs> yeah so I, I personally have actually I, I so there are two well I that I that I know of there you have to use a polarizing filter so the thing is when you look at the moon with a telescope and even with maybe not so much with binoculars but when you look at it with a telescope it actually is, ends up being too bright and it hurts your eyes unless you're looking at it during the day like the three days or moon you can see it during the, in the afternoon before the twilight and then it's okay. But if you look at it at night, it really hurts your eyes. So you need, a, um, it's basically like putting sunglasses in your eyepiece so that you, you faint, you make it a little bit fainter. Um, and so it's basically, it really is like sunglasses. So it's kind of like what they call a polarizer filter. And it's basically a glass that is a little bit dark. Um, the one that I have, can, I can actually turn it and I can make it darker or lighter because it also depends on the moment of the night or the face of the moon that is brighter or not. So you can actually adjust, but the most simple filters are just what they call a moon. And it's actually called a moon filter, right? I think that's mm -hmm. the name. And you just look for a moon filter. They're really cheap. They work fantastically well. It's just like putting sunglasses in your eyepiece and, and there is no much to it and they are not even expensive, but they are <laughs> certainly recommended because you otherwise you, you really hurt your eyes. Yeah, and, and speaking of sunglasses, um, when I'm uh, just doing a, a very quick uh, look at the moon uh, to, and then move on to other things, I actually do use my sunglasses because I have an eyepiece that has a long eye release. So the distance essentially from the edge of the eyepiece to uh, where I put my glasses, I essentially I'm focusing about here and I can see the whole field. So I actually can wear my sunglasses <laughs> while looking through it, but not all eyepieces do that, but uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, it works for me. So that's why I do it. Oh, Corey Hart. <laughs> um, okay, how would you- Okay, uh, uh, so part? I actually, oh. I, I brought my tripod and my binos to demonstrate how I do that. So ah, the, the binoculars have this thin, uh, most binoculars, at least all the ones that I've seen, have this thing here at the front that I can't take off. And it has a screw in here. And so both of my binoculars have it. And uh, all the ones, even the cheap ones, they normally have that screw here at the front. Okay, and then what you have to do is do you have to buy this piece, which is, oops, the O-ring fell down. <laughs> um, 
it's actually really cheap in Amazon. I think I bought it. And if you buy uh, binoculars from All Star Telescope, they uh, can will have it too. And so it's just a little piece that I think I paid ten or fifteen dollars for it. And so it, it does have a screw in there. Oh, sorry. Uh, so it basically screws to the front of the of the binoculars like that in here. And then and then the bottom part, it just has the typical screw that connects to the to the to the bino to the tripod in here. So so I can, this is the head of the tripod and any photography tripod has always the same kind of thing that you will connect to your camera. Um, so this screws into this piece like that. And then you hold the binoculars like that. Um, does it make sense? Um, and then you connect this to the tripod. Uh, so the only advice that I will say is that for example, the tripod that I have for my camera doesn't go high enough. You really need a tripod that goes high because when you wanna look at things close to the zenith, you're gonna tilt your binoculars up. So your eyes are gonna, that means that because you're gonna be looking up, this part is down, right? If this is connected to, so you have to crouch like that. So the, the higher the tripod can go, that means that the less you're gonna have to crouch underneath. <laughs> That's my only advice. Uh, maybe Alistair has, uh, and, and the um, there's sort of three pieces of advice as well that goes along with that. Um, the the um, w one of them is uh, especially if it's well if it's your car your vehicle, lean back on it and because most vehicles the sides actually curve in slightly so you're kind of naturally going back uh, and so that really helps. Um, of course, uh, chances are you're going to get your jacket dirty from the, the dust on the car, but um, it, it, it just really helps. The other thing is, um, it, especially if you have a, a deck chair, like the Titanic deck chairs where that, that uh, angle back really gently, uh, then uh, you can then usually prop your elbows on the side of the uh, fabric of, of the chair. If it's just a regular 90 degree camping chair it's it's still a challenge because you you sort of have to slouch and and your your back kind of usually only take about three or four minutes of that before you um uh, have to uh, say nope can't do that anymore um and then you get a a, a blanket an air mattress a sleeping bag to lie on the ground and then um then you can just prop your uh, shoulders uh, or elbows on the ground. And there's even um, in uh, uh, Terry Dickinson's book, Night Watch, he'll actually have um, a, uh, he has a picture of someone in a, a child's uh, inflatable dinghy. So those little rubber uh, boats that are only uh, you know, about a meter long or so um, is if you partially inflate them and sit inside then your elbows prop up on the sides and it's nice and cushy. And um, just with the weight of your legs on the other, at the other end of the, the, the rubber dinghy, you, you essentially just adjust the angle and it's rock steady and super comfortable. Uh, it may look a little um, weird, but uh, it's uh, anybody who's done a lot of binocular observing um, uh, finds those useful. And then of course, like anything else um, out there in the world is you can actually buy binocular chairs um, that uh, you know, it's another few thousand dollars to get beautiful chair that has bearings to move with and it's super comfortable, but you've, uh, you would only do that if you were a real binocular yeah. fiend. So. Yes, what I'm saying. So the tripod that I got is also from Celestron. Uh, so Celestron, this brand sells uh, telescopes, but they also sell binoculars. And the ones that Alistair has recommended, the Cometron is also from Celestron. And uh, they have a lot of different range of binoculars. And this tripod is more for kind of astronomy binoculars. And as I say, it can, the good thing to me at least is that it has this very long after you stretch it all out, it still has this very long arm, so you can still rise it up 
which is my photography tripod doesn't have that. And, um, and uh, it's very light. And uh, I think I paid like $100 for them. So I, I think to me, although uh, to me, a, a set of a tripod and a set of binoculars is like the first telescope that you should have. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, and I do use them standing up. I don't sit down with this. Um, I, I'm standing up. Yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Anything else? Um, I'll just chime in with a couple of things. Uh, this time of year, uh, from new moon to just past first quarter, the moon is actually riding fairly high in the sky. So a three day old moon will be, won't, won't be right on the horizon. It'll be actually fairly high up and it'll be there through April and a little bit in May. By the time July comes around, it's gonna be very low on the horizon, tougher to spot. Mm. Uh, what else? Oh, you mentioned binoculars for eclipses. You meant lunar eclipses, I'm sure, not solar eclipses. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Well, unless you have a filter, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a fun fact, uh, if you're a fan of Star Trek um, Enterprise, Denobula, which is in the hind area of Leo, is where Dr. Phlox comes from. So, um. so there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Those are fun facts are always good. Yeah. Okay, well, um, everybody uh, have a, a good evening. Thank you for dropping in. And uh, um, we will uh, do a similar thing with a different part of the sky uh, next month. And we'll focus a little less on binoculars and a little more on other things. And uh, just again, remember um, Jeff's uh, uh, presentation next week, what's up in the sky this month for April. For April, yeah. And we're starting to get planets again. Yay. Yeah, we're getting planets in the um, early morning. So just before set up. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Alistair. Good night, everybody. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Thanks very much, Alistair and Berta. <laughs>